I'm Robert Boutelier. Welcome to my video series on the social license. In this series, I approach a social license as a management framework for getting social acceptance for an operation and for managing social political risk. This introduction is in two parts. Here in the first part, we review basic concepts. In the part two video, we'll look at the latest model of the social license and how it can be applied to develop social political risk management strategies. From this perspective, the social license is just another way of saying the level of social acceptance for your organization's activities. It can be quantified and integrated into existing risk management systems. There are other ways to approach the social license, and I compare them in my video on the use of the social license as a piece of political rhetoric. My main focus for now is how the social license can be used as a management tool for gaining and keeping social acceptance. In 2014, John Morrison published a book called The Social License, How to Keep Your Organization Legitimate. Morrison said that all organizations need a social license for their activities. NGOs need a social license. Those that don't have one just don't get funding. Governments need a social license. That's what elections do. They confer a blanket social license that grants legitimacy for the next period. As for the social license of business operations, it's been over a hundred years since the Bolshevik Revolution, and the legitimacy of every category of business is being challenged more than ever in the West. In fact, global surveys show that trust in all sorts of institutions has declined drastically over the past two decades. No one can take a social license for granted anymore. Most of the examples I use for the social license come from the industries I've worked in the most, mining, energy, infrastructure, and finance. The phrase social license to operate originated in mining, and there have been many mining projects stopped by community protests. Management systems for dealing with risk are common practice in organizations. There's been a recognition recently of the growing importance of social political risk. It includes things like damage to the organization's reputation, which then causes financial losses through restricted access to markets or to human resources or to financing. It can also be more direct as when there are boycotts, strikes, or blockades, more restrictive regulations, and outright bans on activities. These can all be summed up as restricted access to vital resources needed for the organization's activity. Risk management is an attempt to manage access to those resources. This is part of a well-verified theory of organizations called resource dependence theory. <clears throat> aiming for a solid social license is, in effect, aiming to lower social political risk. That's because the social license is defined as social acceptance. Social acceptance always occurs in a context. It might be community acceptance, acceptance in terms of general public opinion, or acceptance by the most influential stakeholders. Stakeholders are those groups or organizations who could be affected by the focal organization's activities or who could choose to have an effect upon its activities. Notice that they can self-declare by deciding they're going to have an effect upon the focal organization. Therefore, it's a misunderstanding of the concept to say that you're going to decide who your organization's stakeholders will be. You can decide to identify them, but they have stakeholder status independently of whatever you decide and independently of your recognition of that status. You can decide which ones you want to spend more time engaging with. That's what developing a stakeholder strategy is all about. Because organizations have their own stakeholders, that implies that they're vetted in a network of mutual influence. Lawmakers, for example, are stakeholders of business because they control the regulations. The lawmakers have their own stakeholders. One of them is the general public. In democracies, therefore, the general public is indirectly one of the stakeholders of business because the general public strongly determines what policy ideas are acceptable, and that sets limits on which policy proposals can be converted into regulations for industry by lawmakers.
When trying to find out who the stakeholders are and what level of social license they grant, it's important to keep in mind that, by definition, stakeholders include subcontractors, consultants, employees, and investors. In fact, even the managers and executives doing the strategic plan to manage the social license are stakeholders. For example, an extreme silo structure within an organization with different divisions always trying to gain some advantage over the others is a factor that has to be addressed in the strategy. If ignored, the outside stakeholders will hear different messages from different parts of the organization and as a natural consequence, they will be less likely to trust the organization and what it says. Here are some other basic concepts. The term legal license is a shorthand for all the regulations and permits that are required for a business to conduct its activities. Policy narratives are stories that conclude with proposals for new regulations. They're proposed changes to the rules of the game. For that reason, they are political. They are debated and attacked and often contain attacks on alternative policy orientations. Like all narratives, policy narratives contain some basic elements. The setting or the scene is the policy domain. For example, energy policy, fisheries policy, zoning policy, or educational policy. They also contain social actors who are given attributes and motivations like compassion, innocence, or greed. Central to policy proposals are the definitions of the problem. These can be changed in order to attract more members to the policy advocacy coalition. For example, Save the Whales merged with other movements about endangered species to become biodiversity narrative, which became global habitat protection, which merged with atmospheric pollution narratives to become global warming, which became climate change. With each change, the possibility of building a broader coalition was expanded. Every policy narrative also has at least one proposed solution. These can vary in specificity from something ready to be written into law on the one hand, to a recommendation for giving more attention and resources to certain problems or a certain sector. Also, in the solution component, there is a call to action, sometimes directed at companies, sometimes at governments, and sometimes at individual members of the public. Now I want to explore a little bit about how narratives can be seen as competing with each other for more supporters. This is really about policy coalitions changing their narratives in order to expand their coalition. Resource management is always a political topic and therefore extractive industry projects often get mentioned in political narratives. Let's start with some basic ideas about how narratives change. The social license can be won or lost depending on whose narrative comes to dominate the policy domain. Pro and con narratives often compete with each other and co-evolve in the struggle to gain superior acceptance. Uncontested narratives can gain legitimacy through repetition, regardless of their truth. You can ignore minor narratives if only peripheral non-influential stakeholders believe them, but you need social network data to know if that's actually the case. Also, it's important to remember that different media control different subcultures. The Instagram subculture is not the same as the LinkedIn subculture. The audience that attends live theater is not the same audience that listens to daytime talk radio. Different narratives will circulate via these different media, and it's strategically important to know if these narratives align with different coalitions in the stakeholder network. The legal license can be affected by narratives through their effect on the social license. Regulatory policies come from policy narratives. For example, nationalization is a policy, as are tax rates, permit requirements, labor regulations, etc. All these fall under the concept of the legal license. There's a concept in political science called Overton's Window. It's basically the idea that any policy narrative will only be taken seriously if it falls within a range of similarity to already existing policy. So the most acceptable narrative is the one that justifies existing policy.
nearly as acceptable are policies that are popular but not yet currently in force. A little less acceptable are narratives that are not yet popular but nonetheless sound sensible. Then acceptability gradually diminishes until you get to policy proposals that are seen as radical and unthinkable. The point is that politics is all about dragging that window of acceptability in one direction or another. Proponents of different narratives try to portray their opponents' policies as less popular, less sensible, and more radical. This competition for acceptability can sometimes become so intense that the window splits into two windows. The windows correspond to two different clusters in the stakeholder network. Under extreme political polarization, what seems popular and sensible to one group seems radical and unthinkable to the other group. Well, that's part one of your basic introduction to the social license. Part two of the introduction looks at my latest model of the social license and has an example of how it can be used to manage social political risk. Also, be sure to look for my other videos that go into detail on the many other interesting aspects of the challenge of gaining and maintaining a social license.